magnificent little teaching today. And uh, how many of you have seen the, the program Genius with about Albert Einstein? About Albert Einstein. Have you seen that? Oh, it's phenomenal. It's, you gotta, if you can find it, find it. Watch it. It's like an eight part series with Jeffrey Rush. It was phenomenal. And at the very end of it, He's walking down the street with this little nine-year-old kid, and, and he says, there's nothing special about me, I'm not that smart, I'm just very, very curious. <laughs> and I thought, man, that is magnificent. That's how you read the Bible. That's how you get these amazing nuggets that the rabbis and the sages got, is through curiosity. Yeah, well, today I was reading in the Torah portion, Devarim chapter one, let's go there. Devarim chapter one. Deuteronomy chapter 1, and this, I couldn't get past this one little phrase, and I was very, very curious, I'm not saying I'm a genius, but it turned into this big thing like it usually does, and, and I just wanted to let you know, if you really want to get amazing things from the Bible, you, you've got to look for anomalies and problems and things that are weird that spark your curiosity, and then follow up on them, and then get something cool. So, it was this little phrase in verse 2. Verse 1, these are the words which Moshe spoke to all Israel across the Yardan in the wilderness, in the Arama, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Chatzarot, and Gizahal. It is 11 days from Horeb. Now Horeb is Mount Sinai. It's another name for Mount Sinai. Remember the twin mountains, Horeb and Sinai, the two yeah. breasts out of which milk comes and feeds Israel. Horeb and Sinai. So, they're right next to each other. Um, Eleven days from Oren, <clears throat> by the way of Mount Seir in Kadesh Barnea. And I'm like, what is that doing there? It's a weird phrase. They're not at any of the places listed here. When, when he's talking in, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, he's not at Oren. He's not at, at uh, Kadesh Barnea. And he's not at Mount Seir. It has nothing to do with anything. So I'm like, that is bizarre. I'll follow up on that and see what that's about. So here's what the rabbi said. Moshe said to them, see what you have caused. And there is an exclamation mark in the writings. There's no shorter way from Horev, Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea than by the way of Mount Seir. And even that is a journey of 11 days. But you've done it in only three. That sounds like a rebuke to me at the beginning, but then at the end of it, it sounds like, a, wow, this is amazing, what happened? So it looks like it flipped. It starts out as a rebuke, it ends up as a, as a, like an encouragement or something like that. So I was like, wow, that's a bizarre statement. What does that mean? What is that about? And so I wondered, why the rebuke? And how do we know that they made the journey in only three days? This was written by Rashi. Yeah, where does he come up with it? Exactly. You can't just say stuff. The sages didn't just say stuff. They had, you know, like how concordances, a list of every single scripture about everything. Really? That's how the sages were. They were like walking concordance. You could ask them anything about any word in Hebrew in the Bible, and they'll give you a list of all the verses that pertain to it, that have that word. I, I mean, this is this is what I wanted to be when we had the congregation years ago. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted, if you ask me where verse is, I'll not only tell you where that verse is, I'll tell you all the verses that have that, that word in it. It didn't work out like I wanted, but you know, I made some strides toward it. But that's that's what I like. So I'm like, he couldn't have just said this because he wanted to say it, or by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, although it probably is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I want to know what gives him the authority to say that. He can't just say that. So why the rebuke, and how do we know he made the journey in only three days? Now, in order to understand the story, in order to understand what's going on here, you've got to know, here's where Kadesh Barnea is. Here's where Mount Sinai is. That's where they start. And they go up to around Mount Seir, and then up to Kadesh Barnea. That's the shortest route to take to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. And God had said, you've been at this mountain, Mount Sinai, long enough. Move, go, 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 go. 
they start moving. And where he told them to go was Kadesh Barnea. They followed the cloud and went to Kadesh Barnea. And then they're going to go up, they're going to check the land out, they're going to take the land, done. That's the story. It didn't work out that way. That's what was supposed to happen. Now you also need to know that here, in the plains of Moab, opposite Yericho, which is kind of near Yerushalayim, that's where this is taking place. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, the entire book of Deuteronomy takes place here. That's where he's talking. But they're nowhere near that yet. Right now, he's talking about this journey right here. So that's what you got to know in order to know the story. Now, this rebuke, or whatever it was, says Moshe said to them, See what you have caused. There's no shorter way from Orev to Mount Kadesh Barnea by the way of Mount Sair. And even that is a journey of 11 days, but you've done it in three. Doesn't that sound weird? I mean, doesn't it sound like, you idiots, you made this impossible journey in only half the time. It's very bizarre. Well, you don't know what it means unless you look at the rest of what Rashi said. So here's the rest of the completion of what he said. On the 20th of ER, they set forth from Horeb. And on the 29th of ER, they set, sent the Shlachim, that's what they call the spies. They sent the Shlachim from Kadesh Barnea. Deduct from this the period of time they spent at the graves of lust, where they ate meat for a month of days, and the seven days they spent at Chatzarot for a period of seclusion. Consequently, they traveled the entire journey in only three days. In other words, he tells us where he got three days from, which I'll walk you through so you'll understand. Look at the journey. They go up here, they swing down south, and they go way up north to Kadesh Barnea, and they are set to go into the land. But my question is, who said, I mean, where is it the Bible? It's three days. He says it, but we got to check it. And the, the other question is this. Where, is that when they were supposed to go into the land and take it? This is in the first year, second year of them coming out of Egypt. The second year. They got 38 years to go. All right, so let's check this out. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10. We'll start looking at the story. I'll explain, hopefully I'll explain to you what happened so we can understand why Rashi said what he said, which I believe is by the Holy Spirit. On the 20th of Iyar, they sent forth from Horeb, and on the 29th of Iyar, they sent to Shlachim from Kadesh Barnea. On the 20th of Iyar, they, sent, they, they started their journey, and on the 29th of Iyar, they went to Kadesh Barnea. How many days is that? How many days is that? <laughs> On the 20th of the hour, nine, nine. Right, they're at Mount Sinai, and then they go up here to Kadesh Barnea. And on the 29th, they send them into the land, the spies, to check out the land. That's, that's, How many, nine. that's not three days, that's is it? Nine. That's nine. So then we got a problem. It's not 11 either. It's not 11 either, that's right. <laughs> so now we got a problem. All right, so let's figure out what's going on here. So, Numbers chapter 10. It says in verse 11, Now it came about in the second year, on the second month, it's month ER, ER, on the 20th of the month, that the cloud was lifted from up over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the sons of Israel set out on their journeys from the wilderness. This is the very beginning of what they call the wilderness journey. <clears throat> the 40 years of the wilderness. Now they've already chewed up a year. So now we're into the second year since they left Egypt. So this is now 39 years of wandering that they're going to go on. And this is the very beginning of it. Sons of Israel set out on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai. Cloud, then the clouds settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So they moved out for the first time according to the mouth of the Lord through Moshe. And the standard of the camp starts talking about all the standards going out in order. And then in verse uh, 33, it says this. They set out from the Mount of the Lord three days' journey with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place, a menucha. Say menucha. Menucha. The whole purpose of this teaching is to teach you this word. 
Menucha. So this is all propaganda to teach you a Hebrew word. Menucha. Menucha. Means rest. To seek out a rest. It doesn't really say resting place. That would that would be makom uh, Menucha. Just as a resting. To seek out a Menucha for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. And it came about when they aren't set out that Moshe said, Rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee from before you. And when he came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the myriad thousands of Israel. Now, when did they set out on their journey? 20th. 20th of Iyar. The 20th of Iyar. Now, Numbers 13. This is when they're at at uh, Kadesh Barnea, and they send these spies out. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Send out for yourself men, that they may search out the land. Now, by the way, they're not spies. Say Shlachim. Shlachim. That means apostles. Yes. And how many are there? Three? Twelve. One from each tribe. There are twelve apostles. Jesus. They are also chiefs of the tribe, but these are shlachim, they are apostles. How many apostles are there? Well, well, well. well they're at Kadesh Barnea, mm. and this is when they go up, the 12 spies, there's 12 apostles, go up to search the land. In, in verse 33 where it says the mountain of Adonai, which mountain is that? That's Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, okay, that's what I'm talking about. Mount Okay, so, and it, says, and it says three days. Um, Okay. Now, they go out on the 20, in 13.1, the Lord spoke to Moshe saying, send out for yourselves men that they may search out the land. There's 12 of them. They're shlachi, they're apostles. And they go out on the, what day? What, what day? 20th. Not the 20th. They started their journey on the 20th from Mount Sinai. What date is it when they send those flachim? The 29th. Remember, we're told that by Rashi. The 29th, which I'll explain to you. The 29th of the year. Now, Numbers 14. You know the story? The shlachim, the apostles go in. Two of them are good apostles. The red and the other ten are lousy apostles. They come back. They discourage everybody. And this is the day that that God changes everything for Israel. This, this day that they come back from searching out the land and they give this bad message, this bad rumor, it's the day that everything changes for Israel for the worse. It is the day on which God says, you will not enter the land. You're going to die in the wilderness. You're done. I'll get your kids and they'll do it. Now, I haven't told you what day this is yet. Numbers 14, verse 29. After they come back, they give the report. Your corpses shall fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to all the complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have complained against me. Surely you will not come into the land which I swore to settle you, Settle you except for Caleb ben Yehuneim and Yehoshua ben Nuna. It sounds like God is saying, "You're not going to come into what? You're not going to come into what? <laughs> Guys, it sounds like God is saying, "You're not going to come into what? To rest. What? What is He saying? Into what? That. Into what? <laughs> Let's read it again. I'm not getting an answer. Your corpses shall fall in the wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against, who have complained against me. You will not come into the land which I swore to settle, etc. What does it sound like God is taking them into? You won't come into Israel. Say it. Land. 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 That is not the truth. I'm going to prove it to you. This is not what God is saying. He uses the word land, Eretz, but it is not land he's concerned about, not in any way, shape, or form. And I'll prove it to you. What he's looking for at Kadesh Barnea for them to go into is Menucha, whatever that is. He wants to take them into Menucha, and he's telling them, 
you're not going to enter my Menuchah. I'm swearing to you. I'm making an oath forever. You are not going to enter my Menuchah. The only first, time God ever said that. Which verse was that? That was which one? The, the, the oath or no. what I just read was 29. Yeah. Okay. 1429. Now, verse uh, 34. Okay. okay, that was third. Sorry. Surely you shall not come into the land. Sounds like it's talking about that. Verse uh, 33. Your sons will be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness. They shall suffer for your unfaithfulness and through your corpses lie in the dust. According to the number of days that you, that you searched out the land. How many days did they search out the land? 40 days. 40 days. For every day you shall bear your guilt. A year for each day. You went in and you didn't even see for 40 full days. You had blinders on. So you're going to spend 40 years with blinders on and then you're going to die. That's what he said. Now the day on which this happened is important. It's very important. The Mishnah in Ta'ani 29a says that God made this horrible declaration to Israel on the 9th of Av. It's one of the five bad things that's recorded in the Mishnah in Ta'anit that happened on the 9th of Av. 9th of Av is in two days, guys. It's on Monday. It's an awful, awful day. Now, we're at the, we're at the tail end of Bain Hamid Sarim, the, the uh, three weeks that are bad. Bad, bad three weeks. Horrible three weeks. And 9th of Av ends it. It's a bookend of it. And it's the day on which both temples were destroyed, 556 years apart. Yes? Um, if you notice in the news, this period of time has been really bad. A lot of bad stuff happened in Israel. So, yeah, in Israel, Israel traditionally has very bad things happen during Bay Comet's reign. And this year is no exception. Yeah. If you've been following the news, Israel's just in deep kimchi for the last three weeks. And it's always like that. The Jews in Israel are like, well, what else is new, right? Yeah, and it happens every year. Um, if you can learn the cycles of God, you can learn to roll with punches. And that's what Israel basically does. They roll with punches. They just hide in God for these three weeks. Now, the ninth of Av is when this declaration was made, you shall not enter my menucha. Where are they? Where is Israel when he says that? Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh. It means holy. What does Barnea mean? I don't know. I don't know what Barnea means. Son of Nea. I don't know. What right. I don't know what Barnea means. I was wondering about that. But Kadesh, which is called many times, just means holy. So all we got to do is count back 40 days. Because they, they went out and they searched the land for 40 days, yes? Yeah. Ninth of Av, he makes the declaration. We back up 30 days, what's the date? The, the ninth of the month before, Tammuz. Back up another 10 days, what's the date? The last day of the month before that, which is Yar. Got it? Okay, we're dropping out Sivan. You dropped out Sivan. It's ER, it's ER, Sivan, Tanus, Av. So, oh, the month of the grave of the grave of lust. That's right. So they come to Kadesh Barnea here, and they spend a month there, which we'll get to in a bit. So if we back up 40 days, I got it, I got it long here for you. It's the 29th of Sivan plus 30 days is the 29th of Tammuz plus 10 days is the 9th of Av. Got it? Yeah. So we got to get to the 29th of Sivan at Kadesh Barnea. Now we know this. We know that from Deuteronomy 1 2, it says, How long should the journey have taken them? 11 from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. 11 days. 11 days. Uh, Rashi says it took only three, three days, three days. All right, let's go to numbers, let's back up, and let's start subtracting the time period so we can figure this out. Numbers chapter 11. 
The people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and fire the Lord burned among them and killed some of them on the outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried, Moshe, Moshe prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out, and the name of the place was called Tiberi, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. Now this is, this is what the graves are called, the graves of lust, or the graves of greed. They had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? And so Moshe goes to God and says, oh, I can't give a million people food. What do you want me to do, God? And God says, I'm going to give him so much food, it's going to kill him, basically. It's going to come <laughs> off his nose, is what he says. Verse uh, 18. Say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, oh, that somebody would give us meat to eat. We were well off in Egypt, so the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat. You're going to eat not one day, not two days, not five days, not ten days, not twenty days, but for a month of days, is what it says. A month of days. Now, this mistake that I made, here it is, saying that 29th of the year plus 30 days, that's the 30 days that we need to add back in. So it's the 29th of the year plus 30 days of them at the, uh, eating the quail. So that's 30 plus 30 plus 10. And that brings us to the 9th of Av. 29th of Iyar plus 30 days brings you to the 29th of Sivan. Uh, plus 30 days brings us to the 29th of Tammuz. Plus 10 days brings us to the 9th of Av. So unfortunately I dropped that out in notes, I'm sorry. But here it is here in the text. That we have to add the 30 days when they're eating the quail. Which, by the way, Rashi in his wisdom does include it here. Deduct, and he says it in here, but I put dot, 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 I put ellipsis. It says, deduct from them the 30 days that they see. That and the graves of lust, at the graves of lust, where they ate meat for a month of days. So he puts it, I forgot it. All right, so we got, still, we have ourselves at the ninth of all. When they come back, and God says, You are not going to enter my menu Now, verse 33, we've got to add this other day on. Huh? While the meat was still between their teeth, it was before it was chewed, that really made God mad. And the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague, so that the name of that place was called Kibrot Hata'ava, which means graves of lust or graves of greed. How long do you have to bury a dead Jew? One day. One day. You have to get the body in the ground before the sun goes down. So that's why we're going from the 29th of the Yar to the 29th of Sivan to the 29th of Tammuz plus 10 days. We have to have that last, it's actually four, uh, 31 days. We got 30 days when they eat the meat, and on that day, God gets really mad, kills them, and before that sun goes down, he's got to have them in the grave. So you could count it as. 30 days or 31 days. 29th of Yar, 29th of Sivan. You could go to the 30th of Sivan if you want. It still works. And then, Numbers 12, 14. Right after this happens, they blow it again. The Lord said to Moshe, if her father had but spit in her face, now what happened was, after all this nonsense, the very next day, the very next day, Miriam starts complaining about Moshe's ex-wife. Did you know that Moshe was divorced? He was. He was divorced. His first wife was Zipporah. His second wife, it says he put Zipporah away. Oh, right. That's the same thing it says about Joseph and Miriam. 
that Joseph wanted to put her away. That's a Jewish idiom meaning divorce. He divorced her. And he had another wife who was black. And so Miriam comes along and she goes, what do you do with a black woman? And so God makes her white. What? He makes her white. He's not going to make the woman white. He makes Miriam white. Look at verse 14. The Lord said to Moshe, if her father would spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days. Why? Because look at verse 12. Verse 11. Aaron said to Moshe, Oh my Lord, I beg you, don't account this guilt, this sin on us, in which we have acted foolishly. Both Aaron and his sister complained about the woman, in which we have sinned. Look at verse 10, sorry. When the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Aaron was leprous, as white as snow. So she complains about a Negro, so he makes her into a white person. I mean, really white, like a dead baby white. And like when the baby dies and they turn white and wrinkly, like that. And it's leprosy. And so I think it got the point across. And then in verse 15, <laughs> Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days. Why? Because she had leprosy. You're supposed to be outside the camp for seven days if you have leprosy. And the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. So it was seven days that they had to add take away here. So we got 29 days plus 30 days plus another 30 days plus 10 days. Brings it to the ninth of Av. And then we have to take away. We have to subtract. People get quail for a month of days. One day for the people to be buried. And then let her be confined for seven days. So that's what Rashi is saying. He's saying you have to take back away one day plus seven days. So we got one day plus seven days is eight days. And we had 11 that it was supposed to take. 11 minus those eight days is how long? Three days. Three days. Did you follow that? That was a lot of math. I'm not good at math. That's why I screwed it up so bad. One day for Miriam. Sorry, one day for the graves of lust to bury them. Seven days for Miriam to be leprous, that equals eight days. It was supposed to take 11 days. Yes? Yeah. you got to take away those eight days. So how long did it take? Three, three, three days. Three days to get from here. That's great to here. Now that's what Rashi is saying. You can believe it or not believe it. In my opinion, it was given by the Holy Spirit. That's what I think. Huh. He says, so much did the divine presence, the Holy Spirit, trouble itself for your sake to enter the land. And because you acted corruptly in the incident of the spies, you were kept going around Mount Sinai for 40 years. By the way, nobody has them wandering in this area. Nobody. Not a single map that I found. They all have them down in the Sinai Peninsula or over, over here. They weren't here. They were in this desert of Mount Seir, over here, the land of Edom, right around the land of Edom. And they were there for 40 years. And why? Why? They grumbled. Because they acted corruptly in the incident of the spies. Not because of the graves of lust, not because of Miriam, not because of anything else, not because they wanted water, not because they wanted food, but because they went into the land, the land, and said, we can't do it. And so God swore in his wrath, you will not enter my menuchah. So he kept them wandering around here for 40 years. Now that's what Rashi says. Let's go to Numbers 10, 33 again. And Doug caught this. I don't know if anybody else caught it. Numbers 10, 33. They set out from the Mount of the Lord three days journey with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a menuchah for them. That's the journey that Rashi is talking about. This is when they first set out under the cloud of God. This is their very first setting out. And how long is the journey? Three days. How long did it take them to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea? Three 
three days. That's the journey it's talking about here. This is confirmation of what Rashi says. Now why Rashi doesn't quote it, I don't know. I found it. Doug caught it. Maybe some of you caught it. And he was searching for what? Menuhan. Menuhan. He was searching for a resting place. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 is, this is what we sang from the Paul Wilbur song. No, sorry, Psalm, Psalm 132 is, is the Paul Wilbur song. This was my song, Psalm 68, verse 22. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, and let those who hate him flee before him. When was that said? By Israel? No, every time the ark was taken up and set out. I just read it in Numbers. Ten, did you forget? Every time the ark would come, get up and they'd start carrying the ark, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee from before you. This is quoting that. And it's a Shavuot passage. And then in Psalm 132, this is the Paul over Psalm saying. Verse 8. Arise, O Lord, to your menucha. Arise, O Lord, to your menucha. You and the ark of your might. So where does he want the ark to go in this verse? Where is the ark supposed to go? To your resting place, to your menucha. Arise, O Lord, to your menucha. You and the ark of your might. Every time the ark got up, started traveling, which is why we need to stay under the cloud and not get ahead of the cloud or behind the cloud. And don't get ahead of the ark because you don't know where it's going. But we do know this. The ark is going to one place and one place only. God's menucha. God's resting place. Whatever that is. Now we need God to define for us what is that? What's God's menucha? We could say it's all kinds of stuff. We could say it's Christ if we want to. You could say anything you want. What we need to do is find out how God defines it. What is God's menucha? Again, so much did the divine presence trouble itself for your sake to enter the land. And because you acted corruptly in the incident of the spies who were kept going around once the year for 40 years, you couldn't enter into what? Menucha. Menucha. Numbers 10, 33. They left the mount of God going ahead of them for three days to lead them to seek out a menucha for them. That's how long it took for them to come to the border of Israel. All they had to do after those three days was go up for 40 days, search out the land, have a great attitude, get happy about it, come back and go, okay guys, let's go. We're there. We got the menucha. And everything would have been great. All of history would have been different. But they did. They couldn't. For whatever reason, they just couldn't do it. And so everything has changed. Every, everything is different. That which should have been 11 days took only three. Now, what if we reverse that? What should have been 11 days only took three. That's fantastic. What if we turn it around? Something that should have been three days took 11. Do you think that would be a good picture or a bad picture? Bad. Do you think that would be a good picture or a bad picture? Yeah, yeah what it is. It could be either way. Okay. Well, I found one. There's probably a bunch of them in the Bible, but because I am not the scholar I used to be, I only found one. 1 Samuel chapter 9. This is about Shaul, the king. Verse 3, the donkeys of Kish, that's uh, Shaul's daddy, were lost. Kish said to his son, Shaul, take with you one of the servants and get up and go search for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country, he goes through Ephraim, he passes through the land of Shadisha, he couldn't find them, he passed through the land of Sha'alim, they weren't there, he passed through the land of Benjamites, he couldn't find them there. They came to the land of Zuth, 
fellow said to his servant who was with him, come, let's get, we gotta go back. My dad's gonna stop worrying about the donkeys. He's gonna start worrying about me. So we gotta go back. But they don't. How long were the donkeys lost? Three years. 19, verse, uh, chapter nine, verse 19. Now what happens is Shaul and his servant end up in this big adventure and they end up with the prophet of Israel, Samuel. And in verse 18, uh, Shaul approached Samuel at the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. And Shaul said, That's me. Go before me to the high place and you shall eat with me today. Now, all this stuff starts happening. Now, all he's worried about is getting back to tell his dad, Dad, I couldn't find the donkeys. Don't worry. Maybe he'll find the donkeys were found. Who knows? But he says in verse 20, As for the donkeys which were lost three days, so we know that the donkeys were lost three days. That's all this should have taken. He should have gone out, met with the prophet. The prophet says, you're going to be the king. He goes, oh, goody, thank you. Go back home. The story's done. Everything's happily ever after. But that's not what happens. Verse 25. When they came down from the high place into the city, Shmuel spoke with Shaul on the road. And they arose early, and it came about at daybreak. Now it's a new day. So how many days in the story is it? Four. Four, four days. Now it's the fourth day in the story. And uh, verse 27. As they were going down to the edge of the city, Shmuel said to Shaul, Say to the servant that he might go ahead of us and pass on. But you you stay here. I'm going to talk some stuff to you. I'm going to talk to you about what God wants to say. And in chapter 10, by the way, a whole bunch of stuff happens. And it makes it sound like months pass. I mean, it talks about all kinds of adventures take place in the next couple chapters. Chapter 10, verse 8. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you to offer the Olah and the Zebachim, the sacrifice of Shlam, Shlamim, peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you. Wait seven days until I come to you. It's the fourth day in the story still. He tells him to wait seven days. How many days is that total? Eleven days. It's eleven days. So now, what should have taken three is now going to take seven, uh, eleven. What should have taken three days is now going to take eleven. Do you think this is going to be good or bad? Good. Let's find out. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8. You shall go down before me to go down, and the will come down to offer this of you. Wait for me seven days. I'll come to you, and I'll show you what you must do. Then, right after that, he anoints him king of Israel. And all these things start happening, all these adventures. And I think, I'm reading this, I'm thinking months pass. Now go to all the way to chapter 13. Verse 9. Battles take place. A war takes place. The coronation takes place. All kinds of stuff happen. And I'm thinking, well, this is months at least. Chapter 13, verse 9. Shaul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offering. And he offered the Olah. And it came about as soon as he finished offering the Olah, that behold, Shmuel came. And Shaul went out to meet him and greet him. Shmuel said, What have you done? And Shaul said, because I saw the people were scattering for me. Now in verse 8, it says this. Now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Shmuel. That's all the time that's passed. <laughs> and there's been a coronation, a battle, a war, an actual war. A localized battle. A coronation took place where he pours the oil on on Samuel's head, I mean Shmuel's head, Shaul's head, and anoints him. All this stuff happens, and it's only been seven days. Hmm. So, the seven days come to pass. Verse 9, Shaul said, bring me the burnt offering. And in verse 10, it came about as soon as he finished offering the Olad, that the old Shmuel came. Who's offering the offering? Who's offering the offering? Shaul. Shaul. The king, not the priest. So he takes on the role of the priest. And this is what makes 
uh, Samuel so mad. And this is what makes God so mad. Verse 9. Verse, sorry, verse 11. Shmuel said, Why have you done this? And Shmuel said, Behold, and I saw the people were scattering, and you didn't come within the appointed days. And the Philistines were assembling in Michmash. So I said, Well, the Philistines will come down against me, Gilgal, and I'm not asked God's favor. So I did it. I forced myself, and I offered the sacrifice for God. And he makes it sound real noble. Verse 13, Shmuel said to Shovel, You have acted stupidly. You have not kept the meat spot of the Lord your God, which he charged you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom and over Israel forever. But now your kingdom will not endure. You're done. How long did he reign? How long did he reign as king? Seven days. Three days. It was the fourth day when he got anointed. Oh, yeah. Right. Now it's the seventh day. He reigned for three days. Done. This is an 11 day story that ends horribly. It should have been three days and wonderful. We got a king, we can do, serve God, the Israel's going to prosper, we're good to go. But instead, he cuts his kingdom off. Now, in my opinion, take it or leave it, God put this in here, and if you look at it carefully, God put this in here to count up the days to show you this. It's not a land that you're supposed to go into. What is it? A kingdom. The kingdom of the king. That's what was supposed to happen in three days. It didn't happen. These guys didn't go into Israel from Kadesh Barmea and get what God was giving them, which was called Menucha. They didn't get it after three days. So in my opinion, that's why God put this story of Shaul in here. To show us that the Menucha is God's kingdom. It is God's kingdom. And I'm not talking about some ethereal, you know, flighty, airy, ethereal kingdom of Jesus. I'm talking about a literal, countable, touchable, feelable, presentable, seeable, smellable, tasteable thing, a noun, kingdom. Remember, it says that they left the mountain of God, the ark going ahead of them, for three days to seek out a menucha. Yes? Yes. yes. To seek out a menucha. Well, if you look at the seven-day plan of God, what year did Yeshua die? 4,000. What day is that? Day. What day is that? The end of the fourth, the end of the fourth day. day. One day, two days, three days, the kingdom. Three days. That's what should happen in the pattern that God created. The ark goes out for three days to find God's minucha, to find God's rest. So if we can find somewhere in the Bible that God defines this day, this day set, God's Shabbat, His kingdom, as Menucha, we got it. And we can call it what they call doctrine. We can say that this is what God is trying to, to show us. Go to Joel chapter 6. Right before Amos, right after Hoshea. Joel chapter 6. Verse 2. <laughs> the wrong book. It's Hoshea, sorry. Hoshea chapter 6. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will, and now it says revive, but you know what word that is in Hebrew? Resurrect. Okay. He will resurrect us after two days and raise us up on the third. Here's the death of Yeshua. He has, he, he has wounded us. We've been wounded and beaten and chased out of every nation, the Jewish people. Israel has been hurt horribly for 2,000 years. But He will bandage us after two days on the third. He will resurrect us. He will revive us on the third day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Yes. yes? Can you see that as prophecy of the day of the Lord after 
the fourth day. Yes. Day four, one, two more days, and the third day is the seventh day. Yeah. All right, now Psalm 95. This is the kicker passage. Psalm 95, verse 4, verse 3, the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are also his. What am I reading? Maybe it's 96. No. 94. Oh my gosh. I lost it. Well, we're going to come back across it. It's, we're going to come back across it because there will be a footnote. Now, we're going to have to skip it until I find it. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 quotes this mystery passage. I, want to more about. I can't hear you. It's between 95 and 100 songs. There's a doubt. It's all my, I'm uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 3. I can't believe I messed up that verse. But we'll get it in a second. 3 verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me. They tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. So I was angry with that generation who said they always go astray in their heart. They did not know many ways, and I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my menucha. Now, look for the footnote. Where is that? that 95.7? What is it? Maybe 95.7? Well, it should be. 95.7. 95.7. Okay, I just didn't go far enough. 95.7. This is what he's quoting.
you guys are not going to enter my menu con. We have to stop looking at this. They all go the same day. Let me say it again. Everything in Judaism works this way. Physical first, then the spiritual. But if you just look at the physical, you miss what the message is. And what I want to do is get this spiritual part absolutely nailed down tight. So he was not referring to the land. Of course he was. I mean, physically he was. Right. But he's not referring to the land. He's thinking of something more. He's thinking of something bigger. Now that is exactly the point that the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Shalom, is trying to speak. And he does it really clearly. So if we walk through this, hopefully we'll be able to nail it down tight. All right. Verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there should be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called, what? Today. Today. Remember, he quoted that. That's what God said in Psalm 95. He said, there, um, today, oh, yeah. if you hear his voice. See, so you missed it. Today. I missed it the first 37 times I heard it too. Today, if you hear his voice. He was talking to the dudes at Kadesh Barnea in that generation, and he called that time period what? You got, you got to answer back, or I'm not going to be able to know if you did. Today. He called that time period way back here today. today. Right here. He called that time period today. As, and he says, be careful day after day, as long as it is still called today. Day after day after day after day after day, as long as it's called today. Therefore, how long does the today last? Six, six days. Six, six, how, how, how many years does today six, last? Six thousand. All right, six thousand. Six, today is six thousand years long. Because that day is a different and day. Then, right, right. And then the day after that is something else entirely. Yeah. This yeah. is not called today. It's called something else. Today and that day, there's two days. That's right. Okay, but you've got to read carefully. He's trying real hard to make this very clear. Take care, brothers, lest there should be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart and fall away from living God. But encourage each other day after day, as long as it's still called today, lest any one of you be hardened in the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Messiah if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance from to the end. While it is said, he quotes it again. He quotes Psalm 95 again. Right. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like when they provoked me. And who provoked him when they heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt let by Moshe? In other words, all the way back here is called today. today. Thank you, uh, they uh, must have understood that. <laughs> and with whom was he angry? Okay, verse um, 18. And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his what? Menuha. These guys, all the way back here, he said, You are not going to enter my Menuha. Therefore, let's be afraid, lest while a promise remains of entering his Menuha. Now we're all the way up to here, to the first century. And right here, day five. Still today. And it's still called today. And he still says there's a promise of entering his what? His menuha. So that means that all this time period, God was giving a promise of entering his menuha. And yet, you ask people what the kingdom is? They don't know. Believers don't know what the kingdom is for the most part. They don't have it like rock solid, nailed down tight, so they can picture it in their minds and, and they can describe it and know what's going to happen and when. We're supposed to know this day. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they did, just as the guys at Kadesh. They heard it, but it didn't profit them because it wasn't united with faith, with understanding, and the people who heard it. 
don't, don't, don't get lost now, because he's not done. For we who have believed enter that what? All right. Now he's going to start nailing it down. He could be talking about land so far. He could be talking about just good feelings so far. But now he's going to nail it down and show you he's not talking about them. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day. Now it doesn't say day in the Greek, in the Greek it's italicized. He doesn't say, he says somewhere concerning the seventh, and God rested on the seventh, now he says day. He rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter by Menuchah. Therefore, Menuchah equals seventh day. Okay. We know for sure that the Menuchah of God equals a day. It does not equal the land of Israel. He was not talking about the land of Israel, going into the land of Israel. He was, of course, physically. That but that's big, not where his head was at. Yeah, that was the picture. That was not what he was talking about. And he's going to make it even more clear here. He's not done. Since therefore, it remains for some to enter it, the Menuchah, and those who formerly had the good news preached to them failed to enter because of non-submission, not disobedience, non-submission, and that's right about here, they did not enter his rest, just like we've had the good news preached to us, they had the good news preached to them. He again fixes a certain, what does it say? Today. To, no. He again fixes a certain what? What does it say? A certain day. Day. A day. This is now the fourth time he's said day equals Menuchah. He again fixes a certain day. Today, same through David. Now, he's got today being all the way up here, the year 3000, with David. So now we can say for sure that today is back around day three. We can say that today is day four. We can say that today is day five because we're just into day five with the believers. He again fixes another day, saying, where did I, where did I end up? Again, he fixes a certain day. Today, saying to David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Did you follow that? Yeah. Who was it that said this verse in, in Psalm 95 that he keeps quoting over and over? Who said it? Now we... David. David, all the way back here. Who was it that heard it before David? The people at Kadesh. Yeah. And they rejected it. And then David prophesies it. And then Shaul said it. Sorry, where am I? Over here. The writer of Hebrews says it again. And they keep calling that day today, the time period today. Now look, now he's going to really nail it down. If you didn't get it yet, if you don't get it after this next verse, you're not going to get it, period. <laughs> Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them Menuchah, he would not have spoken of another, what does it say? Day. Why doesn't it say land? Because it's not talking about land. Right. It ain't talking about land. If Joshua, who led Israel into is led the Jewish people into Israel, if that's what God was really after, this verse couldn't exist. But that's not what God was after. I mean, God wanted it, of course. It's absolutely important. But that's not what God was trying to communicate. He's trying to communicate that God has a menuchah for us, for the Jewish people throughout the last four thousand years. There's a menuchah. And yet, ask most believers, what's the kingdom? They don't know. They can't define it. They can't nail it down tight. All we get from this passage is this, and we can say without any contradiction, without any fear of contradiction, God's rest is not found in Jesus. Now that's a true statement. Absolutely it is. God's rest is Menuchah. 
is found in a day. In that day. It's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's, right? he's, it's found in a day. And that's why it says he's the Lord of the Shabbat. He's, he's the Lord of Shabbat. Why? Because the day is God's rest. It's his menucha. And he's got it for everybody. And yet, ask people what it is. They don't know. So we got a problem. Can you see the problem? Why weren't we taught about the kingdom? I'm sorry, about God's rest, about what it's like, what's going to happen, what are the dates on which things are going to happen? Obviously, we're supposed to know from this, I take that. For if Yeshua, if Joshua, had given, Yehoshua had given them rest, Menucha, he would not have spoken of another day after that. There remains, therefore, a Shabbat rest for the people of God. And it's not. He defines the day. It's right. And it's not dying and going to heaven. No, you can't enter if you can't find the door. Yeah, you can't enter if you can't find the door. That's, that's for sure. Who's the <clears throat> there remains, therefore, a Shabbat rest for the people of God. And it doesn't mean resting on the se our seventh day of the week. Yeah. Remember, physical first, then the spiritual. They have to match. It means there's another Shabbat coming, a bigger Shabbat coming. Let us therefore diligently, diligently work to enter that Menuchah. Lest anyone fall through the same example of stupidity that the guys at Kadesh did. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Remember, it said, after two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he will raise us up. You're supposed to know when that's going to happen. And I mean specifically, what date? What year? When? What's it going to be like? What's going to happen? How is it going to happen? Where are you going to be when it happens? You've got to be able to define everything as much as it's defined in the Bible. This day. The kingdom. Because the whole Bible is about it. Every single prophet saw this day. Every single prophet wrote about it. So, let's recap, shall we? What should have taken 11 days to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. 11, by the way, is not a good number. It's bad. Bad stuff happens in the Bible on 11, always. <laughs> What should have taken 11 days was actually, it only took three. Why? Because God's ark was lifted up, the priest carried it, and he went to find them what? Menuhah. Menucha. He went to find them Menucha. Guys, come on, I'm going to find your rest. Come on. Well, it's going to be actually another 4,000 years in the future, but we'll get there. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We'll be fine. We'll get there. <coughs> So, God's always, always, always been concerned with the Menuchah, with the rest, with the day of the Lord, with the kingdom. All the way from Enoch, by the way, it says in Jude. Jude, it says, I'm uh, sorry, Enoch saw wow. yeah, that's right. the kingdom. Yeah. It says that. It that's says it. he saw the coming of the Messiah for the ten thousands of his holy ones, which is Yom Kippur, the year 6008, if you're interested. But this, this is what our mind is supposed to be on. Not the physical land. What is that future kingdom going to be like? We've got 66 books that talk about it, and yet nobody knows what it's going to be like. We've got a problem. So I'm giving you a task. On your own, go look up stuff about the kingdom. Start to get to know it. All you got to do is look at any verse that says, in that day, day of whatever, any adjective, pick one, there's thousands of them, and it's always talking about the kingdom. Or, count up the days in the story, and it's going to give you a picture of the kingdom. You might think I'm obsessed with the kingdom. Well, we ought to be. That's my point. We ought to be. There was a, you ever see the movie The Chosen? Yes. Okay. Remember the movie The Chosen? This Hasidic rap Rebbe, he says, there was a, a, a man, he was, he was nuts, he was crazy about the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. 
A bird should chirp outside. It's the Messiah coming. It's the Messiah coming. Everything was coming. That's how I am with the kingdom. That's how I am with the kingdom. And that's how we're supposed to be. So I'm tasking you to start moving toward that. It takes a long time to get there because of all the mission gossip we've got in our heads. But you know, you got to work through it. But if you work through it and you spend time working through it, you're going to start having forming in front of you a picture of the kingdom. And it is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And when you go back and read the Bible, it takes on a whole new dimension. And you get your head where God's head has been at from the beginning. Even for Kadesh Barnea. And if they'd have gone and they'd seen it, they'd have, God, what have you got for us? This is amazing. And come back with that message, it would have changed the world. The Jews would have had the kingdom then. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your your malchut, your kingdom. Your malchut Hashemayim, the kingdom of heaven. Your malchut Elohim, the kingdom of God. Your malchut Menucha, your kingdom of rest. I thank you, Abba, that you call Shlomo, you call Solomon, the king, because his name was Shlomo, and you said, he will give my people Menucha. He will give my people rest. And he sat on a throne, seven steps, the throne being on the seventh. And I thank you, Abba, that we are taking six steps into your kingdom, up to the top of your kingdom, the seventh step. And I ask that you begin to reveal it to us, and not just to us, but reveal it to all Messianic Jews, and as many Gentiles as we can get, Lord, I'll take whatever I can get. Abba, I ask that you begin to open up all of your body's eyes to the Malchut to the Menucha, the rest that you have promised us, so that we can see it, picture it, smell it, taste it, understand it. And it's so real to us that it can never be taken away. Thank you, Abba. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.